Let me say welcome once again to a special Perspectives on Ocean Science lecture that features fellowship graduate students from Scripps. Uh, before we get to these four very interesting talks, uh, allow me to say a few words. Uh, first off, I just cannot emphasize enough how vital graduate students are to the health of Scripps. It's uh, perhaps the most important contribution of Scripps to the community are our graduate students who take what they've learned here, including the knowledge they themselves have created, and they disseminate it around the world as they go on with their careers. Scripps graduate students are truly the future leaders in ocean research and education. Well, just as graduate students are essential to Scripps, so are fellowships essential to our ability to attract and retain the very best students. Fellowships are especially wonderful in student recruitment, where the extra attraction of fellowship can make the difference in getting the very best students. These early fellowships give students the ability to look around scripts and decide on a research topic that most interests them. Well, we need fellowships throughout a student's career, and fellowships during the last year are also very important as the demands of writing a dissertation can be quite challenging to say the least. So for me and from all of Scripps, I want to offer a heartfelt thank you to all the fellowship donors, many of whom are in the audience today. So thank you from Scripps. Well, graduate school offers a time and place for learning. It's fair to say that most of the time that graduate students spend here, they spend learning how to do research. But also important is learning how to communicate what they have learned. So today's event is a, an excellent learning experience for our students as they communicate what they've learned to you. It is in this spirit that I invite you to listen and join in the education of Scripps students. Our first student lecturer today is Jessica Meir. Jessica comes from Caribou, Maine, and she did her undergraduate work at Brown University where she earned a biology degree. She has an MS in space studies from International Space University in Strasbourg, France. Before coming to SIO, Jessica worked at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston doing research on human physiology in microgravity. Her current studies focus on diving physiology in marine mammals and birds in the lab of Paul Panganis. Uh, Jessica's talk today is Diving Emperor Penguins, Getting to the Heart of the Matter. Jessica. Okay, thank you, Dan, and thank you all for coming tonight. As Dan just mentioned to you, I'm going to be speaking about heart rate in diving emperor penguins. The emperor penguin is a top predator in the Antarctic ecosystem. As you may have seen in the movie March of the Penguins, emperors depend on the sea ice for breeding, often facing harsh conditions in order to hatch and raise their young. To feed, however, emperor penguins depend on the ocean. Their diet consists exclusively of, of ocean organisms, ranging from krill to fish to squid. So therefore, emperor penguins must dive in order to eat. This is where we come in, in the lab of Paul Panyanis, as Dan mentioned. We're interested in studying the diving physiology of organisms such as the emperor penguin. The emperor is the premier diver among birds, making routine dives between 5 and 12 minutes which coincidentally is the amount of time I'll be speaking to you today. So if you can just imagine holding your breath for the entire 12 minutes of my talk, maybe you can get an idea of what it's like to be an emperor penguin. And that is just an average dive for these birds. A record dive has been recorded at over 27 minutes, so pretty remarkable. Emperors can also dive to significant depths, in some cases over 500 meters. With this exceptional diving ability, an emperor penguin is an ideal species in which to study the unique adaptations of diving animals. This, have, this has applications to comparative physiology and in some cases to human medicine. 
So if we think about the emperor penguin as depending on a dive in order to eat, we might realize that an increase in the duration of a dive may imply an increase in the likelihood of capturing its prey and therefore successfully eating. So then it becomes logical to think about what is the actual limiting factor of dive duration. Since any air breathing organism like the emperor penguin must hold its breath for the entire time while it's, while it's submerged, the duration of any given dive is dependent on how much, how much oxygen is in the animal's body at the beginning of the dive and also how quickly that oxygen is utilized. So I said I was going to speak to you today about heart rate. So why should we study heart rate and how does it relate to dive duration and to oxygen usage? Previous studies on both terrestrial and marine organisms have shown that heart rate is a good indicator of the transport rate of oxygen within the blood and also of the delivery of oxygen to the tissues. It's common to see a decrease in heart rate upon submersion for diving animals and this has been well documented in species ranging from elephant seals to gray seals and other species of diving birds. So again, if we want to think about this in the context of dive duration and oxygen usage, we can, we can try to think that if there's a decrease in heart rate, this might mean that there's a decrease in the rate at which oxygen is utilized. So what I'm saying here is that oxygen will be available for a longer period of time, which could imply Allow, allowing for an increased duration of the dive. So we can think of this as sort of a oxygen and energy conservation strategy for these animals. A heart rate can be measured with ECG or electrocardiogram. You may be familiar with ECG, you may have had them performed on you in routine physical exams and this is the same concept we're talking about here. Basically an ECG records the electrical activity of the heart as measured across the surface of the body. And this is uh, representing the sum of all of the action potentials from all of your individual heart muscle cells. With an ECG, we can obtain information on heart rate, heart rhythm, and also any abnormalities that might be present. Here you can see this is a characteristic ECG waveform. So basically this shape is representing one cardiac cycle or one heartbeat. So the goal of the project, which I'm going to talk a little bit more to you today, was to measure the cardiac response to diving in emperor penguins using a digital ECG. By obtaining heart rate from these ECG records, we can assess heart rates during the dive in relationship to surface and resting heart rates, the duration of a dive, activity levels, and the previously measured aerobic dive limit. The aerobic dive limit is probably a term which you're not familiar with, so I'll try to explain that. Um, basically, this is defined as the duration beyond which blood lactate concentration increases above resting levels. So this is sort of indicating a shift between aerobic or oxygen-dependent metabolism and anaerobic metabolism. You're probably familiar with the byproduct, byproducts of anaerobic metabolism, which uh, manifest themselves as muscle soreness and aching after severe exercise. So basically, this is a, a result of the accumulation of that lactic acid. We conducted this study in McMurdo Sound in the Antarctic using Jerry Coyman's isolated dive hole model. So basically what we do here is we drill two holes in the sea ice in an area where there are no other significant cracks or holes. We transport a group of emperor penguins to the study site, which is also in a fenced in area that we call Penguin Ranch. <laughs> so the emperor penguins have access to these holes, but because there are no other cracks or holes around, they have to come back to the same holes and this makes it easy for us to deploy and retrieve our instruments. We deployed a backpack digital ECG recorder and a time depth recorder on the birds. And we used a two lead electro system. Basically we, pl we placed the electrodes just beneath the surface of the skin along the emperor's back. Here's a picture of our ECG recorder. This is the inside, the microprocessor here. Um, these are some two fully instrumented birds. Here's the ECG backpack recorder, the leads just above and below, and this is a time depth recorder. This is a picture of an emperor penguin diving underneath the two dive holes at the penguin ranch. You can see here's our recorder and here's our time depth recorder here. So now we're going to get to the actual data. This is an actual ECG signal from one of the diving birds. 
If you recall what I, I tried to explain earlier about the characteristic ECG waveform, each of these is an individual cardiac cycle or one heartbeat. So on this screen we have five heartbeats. If we measure the interval between two identical points in, in adjacent cycles, we can calculate the instantaneous heart rate. So here is a summary. There's a lot going on here, so I'll try to talk you through this graph. But in red here, we have the depth, the dive depth profile. That's here on this axis. Depth is in meters. So you can see these dives are around 40 meters in depth. So here's a dive. Here's where the animal's back up at the surface. Another dive, surface, and another dive. Um, you can also see these reversals are likely hunting ascents where the birds are ascending and capturing fish just underneath the surface of the ice. And this behavior has been documented in previous studies of my lab uh, using National Geographic's Critter Cam. In black, we have the heart rate in beats per minute. Um, FH, that's just frequency of the heart beating. So just heart rate in beats per minute here. And you can see there is a characteristic pattern during the dives. There are these periods of high heart rates before and after the dive, around 200 beats per minute, and then there's a significant reduction in heart rate during the dive. So let's zoom in at an individual dive and take a little bit of a closer look there. Here again, you see these high surface interval heart rates, and those are serving to load oxygen before the dive and also to, re to replenish oxygen stores and to rid the body of carbon dioxide after the dive. You can see as soon as the animal submerges and starts descending, there's an immediate bradycardia or reduction in heart rate. The heart rate's really slowing down here. Then we have this period of exceptionally low heart rate and then followed by this ascent or anticipatory tachycardia or speeding up of the heart rate before the animal's actually at the surface. Here's another dive. This is a longer dive. It's an 18 minute and 9 second dive. Remember I said the average was usually around 5 to 12. So here you can see this very low value. The heart rate is actually getting down to three beats per minute. And then followed by this period of six beats per minute for five minutes. So it's not just a temporary thing. For five minutes, it's staying very low. Another interesting note is that these really low values often correspond to changes in the dive profile. You can see right where this low value is, there was a sudden change. The bird looked like it was going toward the surface, but then decided to go back down. So for some reason, maybe the bird decided to prolong its dive, so a lowered heart rate may have provided uh, oxygen stores for a longer period of time, and then it, it could allow itself to stay down for longer. So to summarize this data a little bit, uh, this table represents some average values from our, from our data. The resting heart rate of emperor penguins is around 76 beats per minute. This is pretty similar to humans. Uh, you're probably familiar that uh, human heart rates are usually between 60 and 80 beats per minute with an average of 70, so pretty similar to the emperor penguin. During diving, the heart rate decreases, as I showed you in those previous graphs with an average during the dive of around 64 beats per minute. But I think that becomes a little bit, the data become a little bit more interesting if you divide up the dives between short and long dives. Short dives in this study were defined as those less than 5.6 minutes. Now I tried to define the aerobic dive limit to you earlier. This was actually measured in a previous study as being 5.6 minutes for this species. So short dives here are those below 5.6 minutes, and the long dives are those in which you do have some accumulation of lactic acid, or there's likely some anaerobic metabolism going on. So if you look at these long dives, the value here is only 44 beats per minute, and this is definitely a, a significant reduction from that resting level of 76. And just to put that into a little bit better perspective, let's compare that to an exercising human. During exercise, in order to sustain efficient oxygen flow to exercising muscles, human heart rates increase to around 160 beats per minute. And in cases of severe exercise, there's usually a limit around 180 beats per minute. So you can see, maybe you're getting a feel, this is a pretty remarkable animal. It's actually, it's underneath the ice, holding its breath, swimming and hunting, but it's able to, its heart rate is actually lower than resting levels, and it's still able to sustain itself through all that work. 
One more way to look at that relationship um, between dive duration and heart rate. Here you have dive duration on the x-axis and heart rate again in beats per minute here. You can see, maybe, maybe you could predict from what I've told you, during longer dives there is an overall lower heart rate. That's the average heart rate during the dive. So the longer dives corresponding to the uh, lower heart rates. To conclude, we studied heart rate as an indicator of oxygen usage in a diving emperor penguin. The emperor penguin has exquisite control of its heart rate, with values ranging from 200 beats per minute before and after the dive to extremely low values of only a few beats per minute at the end of long dives. By obtaining heart rate, we can assess relationships to many variables, some of which I've presented to you today and others that I'm continuing to work on for other components of my thesis research. Just wanted to thank um, the, my fellow contributors here, everybody at the Penguin Ranch, um, and also my, my funding sources. Thank you. Let's go on to our next speaker, Allison Labonte. Allison grew up in Alamo, California, and graduated from UCLA. She studied mathematics, marine biology, and in her last year added geology to the mix. She came to Scripps to continue her study in the geosciences, including marine geology projects that require field and undersea exploration. Her advisor is Kevin Brown. Allison today will be speaking about seeps and creeps, measuring the fluid flow at the sea floor. Allison. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you tonight. And I'm talking about seeps and creeps and measuring fluid flow at the seafloor, as Dan mentioned. Uh, to introduce you to um, my subject, I'm going to talk about plate tectonics, and this will give you some idea of the motivation behind my research. The Earth's crust is made up of many pieces, which we call plates. These pieces are always moving. Sometimes they're moving apart, sometimes they're moving together, and other times they just slide laterally against one another. Here you can see a small plate called the Juan de Fuca plate, which lies off the west coast of Washington in British Columbia. This plate shows all three types of plate boundaries. A spreading plate boundary or divergent plate boundary, where new plate is being created and the two plates spread apart from each other. Another example of a plate boundary is a convergent plate boundary, and right on the margin here is a subduction zone. This is where the two plates come together, and one plate is actually subducted underneath the continental plate. And finally, on the northern boundary of the Juan de Fuca plate, is a transform or strike slip fault. Some of you know about San Andreas Fault as an example in California. And that's where plates simply slide laterally against one another. So we study plate boundaries because there are regions of high activity, such as volcanism, earthquakes, and of particular interest in my research is fluid flow. So what do I mean? What kind of fluid flow am I talking about? If you imagine that the crust is like a sponge and you apply a stress or you squeeze that sponge, spaces in between the grains of the rock that are filled with fluids become overpressured. With this overpressure, they want to drain out. Some, in some cases, there's only one pathway to drain out from the rock, such as a crack or a fracture um, maybe along a fault. So we call the surface, surface expression of these fractures seeps. And so why would we want to study the fluid flow coming out of these seeps? Well, fluids tell us about plate movements. Um, stress is built at these plate tectonic boundaries, and the stress is released when the plates move. Plates can move either suddenly, as in earthquakes, or they can creep. It's a slow motion where they just stably slide against one another. 
Seismometers do a good job at picking up these fast movements known as earthquakes, but not such a good job at picking up slow creep. By measuring fluid flow and flow rates, we can detect both earthquake movements and creep. So in the ideal case, we could search for patterns, maybe creeps that aren't detected on seismometers but are detected in fluid flow rates. Um, possibly there's some sort of pattern in those uh, creeps before an eventual earthquake. We don't know. So I have built an instrument which um, we'll put at the seafloor because most of these plate boundaries you might have noticed in the Juan de Fuca picture are laying underneath the ocean. However, to show you an example of um, an on-land case where fluid flow has responded to earthquakes, I'm going to show you a study done by Janssen. And this is a 6.5 strike slip earthquake that occurred in Iceland in the year 2000. Here he shows expected areas of compression and dilation. And compression is those areas where the plate is squeezed or the crust is squeezed. And in those areas, you would expect an increase in pore pressure. And indeed, we do see that increase reflected in well height measurements. So all these dots are wells, and they measured the change in well height as a result of this strike slip earthquake. And they nicely match up with the modeled areas for expected compression and dilation. But now to move into how do we measure these things at the seafloor. I've built an instrument that we call the optical tracer injection system. And it's an electronic instrument. We place it at the seafloor and insert a chamber, or you can imagine just a funnel, into the seafloor. It seals in the sediments. And the flow coming out of the seafloor or going down into the seafloor is directed through a flow line and through the instrument. The way, we act, the way the instrument measures flow rate is pretty simple. We s inject a pulse of tracer dye, so just a small blob, and it travels with the same flow rate as the ambient flow. So if there's downflow in the system, like those places of dilation where the crust is getting stretched, then the blob will travel, the tracer pulse will travel past this detection station. If there's upflow, the tracer will pass in front of this detection station. So we detect the passing of the tracer die by using an LED, which we shine through the tube, and on the other side is a photodiode to sense how much of the light has passed through. So by knowing the time of injection of the tracer, the time of the arrival of the tracer, and the distance in between, we can simply calculate the flow rate at that site. OK, so here's the fun part. I have, after two years at this point, been spending all my time in the lab building an instrument. And then we go and throw it overboard. Um, so this is the fun of oceanography. Uh, this is a picture or a movie of the ROV Ventana. I hope it plays. Uh, I don't know how to silence that. So a remote operated vehicle can be used to carry our instruments to the seafloor. This is the Otis package. And we also use manned submersibles. The package has been deployed with Alvin as well. But that was its first time overboard. And um, actually, the next page scrolls up to where they brought the ROV back up, and it had just accidentally released my instrument to float to the seafloor on its own. <laughs> but that's OK. We found it. So that's the stress of two years in the first deployment, but 
Moving on to look at those results, that was a deployment in Monterey Bay. And they were, we did two test deployments in Monterey Bay. Um, both of them kind of looked like this, seep sites with clams surrounding and living off the fluids. And the measured flow rates at the two different seep sites were quite different. One was measuring about 20 centimeters per year of outflow, which is pretty small. And then the other seep site measured 60 meters per year. Uh, this test deployment demonstrated that with measure measurements every 30 minutes, the Otis flow meter is sensitive to episodic flow events. And so we're waiting and ready for um, detecting rapid changes in flow rate that could occur from an earthquake or creep. However, these were only two to three week long tests, so not surprisingly, no earthquakes or creep were detected. And that suggests the need for longer term deployments. Um, one method for getting a longer term record is using a real time monitoring system. Uh, an exciting part of my research was then uh, linking up the Otis flow meter with an acoustic modem for the data to be transferred from the seafloor via that acoustic modem in a satellite buoy. So that's only the beginning of an um, important development in ocean sciences. Cabled networks such as the Neptune Observatory that you see a schematic of here are um, a wonderful way for scientists to work from their desktops and have a link that provides power to their instrument offshore and also allows them to communicate real time with that instrument on the seafloor. So in conclusion, um, I've developed an electronic flow meter for detecting deformation of the Earth's crust. This Otis meter is ready for hookup with real time ocean observatory networks. Also, many other types of instruments will be hooked up to these networks and together results from those instruments such as seismometers, heat flow probes and um, fluid chemistry samplers. The flow meter rec or flow rate records uh, may help us to learn about the builds up, building up of stress and the release of stress that make up the earthquake cycle. Thank you very much. Well, our next speaker is Travis Medor. Travis is originally from Richmond, Virginia. He graduated from the University of South Carolina in 2001 with a BS in Marine Science. He is in his fifth year as a graduate student studying organic biogeochemistry under the direction of Dr. Lahini Alawahari. Uh, Travis will be speaking on life processes in the open ocean, the story of marine nitrogen. Travis. Okay, um, thanks for having me here tonight and thank you all for being here as well. I was really excited to have this opportunity to come and, and uh, share with all of you the uh, life in the open oceans and the story of marine nitrogen. So I'm just going to begin with uh, this quote by Dr. Sylvia Earle. She's a rather well-known oceanographer. And this was actually found on a Starbucks cup, so you can look for it the next time you go to Starbucks. And it was, it was found by a staff member at SIO who passed it along to the rest of us. And I'm just going to read it. It says, the, the living ocean contains 97% of Earth's water, provides home for 97% of Earth's life, shapes climate and weather, governs temperature and planetary chemistry, generates oxygen, absorbs carbon dioxide, and otherwise makes this planet a hospitable place for mankind. We should explore and take care of the oceans as if our very lives depended on it, because they do. Wow. <laughs> you know, oceans are pretty exciting. Um, these are some pretty substantial claims, and uh, I imagine many of you already accept what she suggests here, but some people might need more convincing. And I just want you to remember that the oceans are huge. They cover two thirds of the surface of the planet. And not only that, um, some places they're 5,000 meters deep. So this is a huge volume of water that's on our planet. So the processes that happen in the ocean <clears throat> when extrapolated over this huge volume can have huge impacts 
on our planet, and that's what Dr. Earl is telling us about here. And these processes, or these impacts, some of them are a result of the physical processes that happen in the ocean, and others are a result of life that's in the ocean. And that's what I'm going to talk about tonight, is life that's in the oceans. <clears throat> this is a satellite image of chlorophyll. Um, chlorophyll, as some of you may know, is the pigment that is used in photosynthesis. And you can just think of photosynthesis as, as what's forming the basis of most food chains that exist on Earth. So chlorophyll is a pigment that absorbs a certain wavelength of light, and we can use satellites to measure that absorbance and get an idea of the abundance of chlorophyll in the ocean. And so we can just think of the abundance of chlorophyll as the abundance of life in the oceans. And that's what this scale is here. The green and red numbers are, are higher abundances of life and the blue is uh, lower abundances of life. <clears throat> so life in the ocean started about 3.5 billion years ago, and about 2.2 billion years ago, we started, notice, we, no, we started to notice that there was oxygen on Earth. And this oxygen is largely due to this process of photosynthesis, where organisms are taking up carbon dioxide and producing oxygen. And <clears throat> it turns out that half of the photosynthesis that occurs on our planet occurs in the ocean. So a lot of the air that we breathe every day is a result of photosynthesis that's happening in the ocean. So I've also told you that carbon dioxide is being taken up by photosynthesis. So it's thought that the life in the oceans can also have a huge impact for global temperatures. And also, some of the organic matter that is produced by photosynthesis sinks to the seafloor and forms petroleum deposits, which is literally fueling our industrial world today. <clears throat> so if we look at this picture of life in the ocean, we see that it's rather patchy. And, and that's largely due to the amount of nutrients that are in the surface of the ocean. And so life in the ocean, like all life, is composed of six major elements. And those are hydrogen, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. And so as you may have guessed, tonight we're going to talk about nitrogen. So why should we talk about nitrogen? Well, nitrogen is an important component of many molecules that carry out many important life functions. For example, proteins are important for cell growth and metabolism type processes. Um, nitrogen is also in DNA, which is important for cellular reproduction. And the nitrogen also exists in the cell wall of organisms, which <coughs> protects an organism from its environment. So nitrogen is a very com important component of all life. And just wanted to point out here, these, these regions in the ocean that are blue, and we call the oligotrophic ocean, or the ocean deserts, have very low abundances of life. And it's thought that the availability of nitrogen in these regions is what's largely limiting the production or the abundance of life in these regions. So it's important to study nitrogen because it's, it's essential for life, and it's directly tied to all those impacts that life in the oceans may have on our planet. So now I want to step back for a second, and I want you to think of the Earth as a globe. And I'm going to call this globe a closed system, and all that means is that it's just like those globes that you see in the holidays. When you shake up the globe, there's all of these snow that gets stirred around, but it stays with inside the globe. So when we're thinking about nitrogen on Earth, we can think about nitrogen that exists in different reservoirs within this globe. And so we're studying the, the, how nitrogen is cycling between these different reservoirs because nitrogen is such an important element in life. It turns out that 99.98% of all the nitrogen in Earth exists in our atmosphere as nitrogen gas. And this gas is very stable and unreactive with biology for the most part. Only 0.02% of nitrogen on our planet is biologically reactive. <clears throat> so, how does nitrogen get from the gas to this reactive form? Well, that's by the process of nitrogen fixation. So it's just converting this atmospheric nitrogen into this biologically available nitrogen. And you can just think of nitrogen fixation as the process by which our oceans are fertilized with nitrogen. Conversely, we have denitrification, which is converting biological nitrogen into the nitrogen gas. So it's the balance of these two processes, which both occur in the ocean and on land, that control how much nitrogen is in this biologically reactive form. So once nitrogen becomes biologically reactive, it, it can begin to fulfill its requirements that sustain life, um, life as we know it. And not only, not only do organisms need nitrogen to grow, but they also use nitrogen um, to, to generate energy for themselves. So biological processes are, are important for converting nitrogen between the different forms that we see it in, in, in our world. 
And <clears throat> one, one point that I want you to take home with you tonight is that not only does nitrogen have impacts for, for the abundance and distribution of life on our Earth, but biological processes and biological processes alone are responsible for converting nitrogen between its different nitrogen forms or its or nitrogen species. And that's a very unique property for nitrogen. I don't think you can say that for any other element um, that's in our oceans. <clears throat> so my thesis focuses on the, the most abundant form of nitrogen in our oceans, and that's called dissolved organic nitrogen. And as you can see, it's the most dominant form of nitrogen in the surface ocean. Um, <clears throat> It's way more abundant than any of the nitrogen that exists in, any of the organi in all of the organisms that are in, in our oceans, including Jessica's penguins that we talked about earlier. And, um, and the, the other forms of nitrogen, um, DIN, which is dissolved inorganic nitrogen, and that's the type of nitrogen that you would put in your fish tanks, like nitrates and ammonia and things like that. So the, the, the nitrogen that's in dissolved organic nitrogen is, is a huge reservoir. And, this is a kind of complicated term, dissolved organic nitrogen. What does that really mean? Well, we're, <clears throat> we're trying to answer that, but you can just think of DON as nitrogen that exists in organic molecules. Um, and those are just molecules that were once part of the biomass of a living organism. Now they've been released somehow, and they're just floating around dissolved in the water. So my research questions have been, why, why is DON so huge? Why is there so much nitrogen in DON? And then also, is there, is there some discernible relationship between the types of nitrogen that exists in the ocean and the types of organisms that exist? And then, and then the molecular structure of dissolved organic nitrogen in different regions. So how have we gone about studying this? Well, we go out to sea um, using, uh, this is the Ravel right here. I've been on the Ravel two times now um, to go out to different locations in the sea. And, We've been out in the middle of these open ocean deserts and also out from San Diego here on the Cal Coffee Cruises. And then we've, been, we've gotten some samples here um, in a, an extreme upwelling region off the coast of Angola. And so just for example, this, this cruise around the Hawaiian Islands, um, we collected roughly 60,000 liters of water. And when we got back to the islands, we shipped home 40 liters of water. And in that water was concentrated DON. And it's rather difficult to study because salts are so abundant in the ocean. So we, we have to take several measures to, to isolate DON from the far more abundant salts in the ocean. <clears throat> so, so as I said, these, these samples came from very diverse regions in our oceans. Um, here are the oligotrophic oceans or the ocean deserts. We have samples from here. And then we also have samples from these very different regions where there's lots of upwelling. And it turns out that these regions also have very different types of life that exist in the oceans. Um, these upwelling regions are dominated by diatoms, which are really large types of organisms <coughs> that are sustained by the high amounts of nitrogen that, that exist in these, in these upwelling regions. Um, in these open ocean regions, we have a, a biological community that's dominated by cyano, cyanobacteria. And these are much smaller types of organisms. So you can see that the biological communities in these regions are very different. So you might imagine if, if we're looking at dissolved organic nitrogen and it's being produced by these organisms, we might be able to see some sort of difference in the type of DON that exists in these regions. So this is a pretty intimidating figure, but this is just an organic molecule. And it might be something that DON looks like. But I said we take the DON back to our lab for analysis. And our analysis is basically just, just looking at different ways of looking at this molecule and trying to see what is the structure of DON. And we have this nitrogen that's bonded to all these sorts of different types of atoms. So we use a variety of techniques, which I've just put as a collage right here. And we, look, we use each of the, all of this information to put together different parts of the puzzle that, that might give us an idea of what nitrogen looks like in its molecular form. <clears throat> but not only are we looking at the whole molecule of DON, but we can also look at the nitrogen atom. And we can look at the atomic structure of nitrogen itself and see and ask the question, does the atomic structure of nitrogen differ between these different areas? <clears throat> so far, what we've found is that everywhere we look, um, DON looks exactly the same, which is pretty crazy considering how, how life changes throughout the ocean. 
every, every DON sample has almost the exact same spectrums, et cetera. So what we take this to mean, well, first of all, this is a very, very surprising finding. Um, and what we take this to mean is that, is that this, this DON reservoir isn't exchanging with these other sorts of reservoir or, or with the organic or the organisms. So nitrogen is locked up in these dissolved organic nitrogen molecules. So, so you can imagine if we go back to this globe analogy, this is a huge reservoir of nitrogen that's just floating around on our, in, in the surface ocean. And, in, and it's interesting that it's not exchanging with these other elements. So, so now my thesis questions have kind of more developed still. Why, why is this DON pool so large? And then are there, are there smaller components of DON that are reacting differently with the different, organis or with the different organisms that are existing? So instead of looking at the entire DON pool, can we look at smaller components of it? And a similar question, does, does DON have any controls on the biological community? Um, so in a year or so, I'll probably be defending my thesis. So if you come back for that, maybe I'll have some answers <laughs> for these questions. Um, but that's all I have for you tonight. And I want to thank my colleagues at SIO and the Birds Aquarium for this opportunity to talk to everyone. And of course, my funding sources. And uh, if you want to get in contact me, here's some information. So thank you. Our final speaker of the evening is uh, Nicole Turkson. After completing a bachelor's degree at the College of Worcester, Nicole went on to do a master's degree in marine science at the University of South Florida, where she conducted research in marine pharmacology and cancer drug discovery. Her current research interests include the chemical ecology of marine invertebrates and the pursuit of new pharmaceutical agents from marine organisms. Her advisor is William Fenicle. Today, Nicole will be speaking on Combating Antibiotic Resistance with Marine Natural Products. Nicole. Thank you, Dan, for your introduction, and thank you all of you for being here today. And as Dan said, I'd like to talk to you this evening about combating antibiotic resistance with marine natural products. So, in 1928, Alexander Fleming discovered penicillin. And this discovery could um, be thought of as sort of heralding an age that you could refer to as the golden age of antibiotic drug discovery, where within a few short decades, a large number of antibacterial and antibiotic compounds were discovered and brought into use as human medicines. So these antibiotics have been so successful that in the late 1960s, the Surgeon General was actually heard to say that we had essentially defeated infectious diseases and could close the book on them. Well, unfortunately, we today know that that isn't true. Um, infection is still the number one cause of mortality worldwide. Well, one of the reasons for this is the dramatic increase in the, the uh, um, incidence of resistant disease causing microbes in recent years. And this has been correlated to the increased use of antibiotics in human populations. Some of you may have heard in the news um, reports of MRSA, or methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus, which is a very problem problematic organism um, against which we only have one effective antibiotic. And in fact, um, in the last four years, the CDC has actually described a strain of MRSA, which is completely resistant to all antibiotics, including vancomycin, which was the one that we had left that was effective against this microbe. So the fear in the medical community is that if this trend continues, one of these days very soon we're going to find ourselves in a pre-antibiotic era, um, such as we once had before the discovery of penicillin, where we essentially have no effective treatments against diseases that we actually thought we had under control, diseases such as tuberculosis. Well, how does uh, an organism become resistant to an antibiotic? And unfortunately, the answer is that resistance is inherent in the mechanism of action of all antibiotics. By virtue of, of being an antibiotic, that a drug actually selects for survivors in, um, in an environment where most, most cells would die. And as an example, I'd like all of you to imagine that um, you in the audience are disease-causing microbes. And you're giving me a sore throat. So I go to my doctor and he prescribes me an antibiotic. 
and I take this antibiotic and I'm able to clear most of you out of my system, all except for those of you who are wearing plaid. And your plaid garments could represent a mutation that you may have had, which allows you to escape the action of this antibiotic. So within a couple of days, I'm probably going to start to feel better, but you plaid people out there are going to start to multiply. And pretty soon, we're going to have an audience of people wearing nothing but plaid, and I'm going to have a whole new sore throat and have to take a different antibiotic. So unfortunately, antibiotic use leads to the inevitable decrease in drug benefit over time. So now I'd like to introduce you to the organism which I work on, um, which is Group A Streptococcus, or GAS. Uh, the species name for this bacterium is Streptococcus pyogenes. And for those of you with an interest in, in microbiology, um, this is a gram-positive organism, which is a facultative anaerobe, um, which just means that it prefers to grow in an anaerobic or oxygen-depleted environment. The cells tend to be um, round to avoid and have diameters of approximately 0.6 to 1 micron in diameter. And they are hemolytic, which means that they are able to lyse red blood cells. Now, this photograph shows you uh, some group A strep which have been streaked onto a blood auger plate. And what you see here is a zone of, um, of clearing, or rather of burst red blood cells, which indicates that they are hemolytic and is one of the ways that um, a laboratory technician would use to identify this organism. And these cocci tend to occur in pairs or in chains. And here's a nice little um, photograph, an electron micrograph showing you what they look like the sort of the pairs that are arranged in chains. And what types of diseases does group A strep cause? Well, it's one of the most frequent human pathogens. And it's estimated that at any given time, 5 to 15% of the population is carrying these organisms as just a natural part of their bacterial um, flora. So it doesn't mean you're sick. It just means that this is where the bacteria live. So, GAS are the cause of mucosal and skin infections in otherwise healthy individuals. They also can infect any part of the body. Um, they can infect pretty much any organ or, or if you get a cut in your skin, any, any um, orifice that they're able to get in and take hold. And some very highly virulent strains are able to produce serious invasive disease, particularly in those patients whose host defenses are compromised. Now these would be um, infants or the very elderly, or people who, whose immune systems have been weakened by things such as organ transplantation or um, underly other underlying diseases such as cancer or HIV disease. Now the strain of group A strep that I work with um, is not such an, uh, an evil culprit. Um, mine actually causes uh, bacterial pharyngitis or what you might know as strep throat. Well why would I want to focus on something so benign? And the answer is that strep throat isn't simply an infection which affects your throat or your upper respiratory system. If it's left untreated, it can lead to much more serious um, conditions, particularly rheumatic fever, which can be a lifelong and um, life-threatening disease. How many of you out there have had strep throat? That's about what I would expect, pretty much everybody. Um, so you might uh, know that the, uh, the treatment for a strep throat typically prescribed is penicillin. However, a lot of people are allergic to penicillin. So in these cases, the drug that's most often prescribed is erythromycin, um, which is a macrolide antibiotic. Um, it's a broad spectrum antibiotic that's typically used to treat upper respiratory tract infections. Macrolide just um, refers to the structure of the molecule. So the mechanism of this macrolide resistant in the resistance in the strain that I work with is known as MEF-A. Um, it's so named for macrolide efflux gene A, um, which encodes this transmembrane efflux pump, which basically, um, to draw you an analogy, acts like a bouncer in a bar. It sits at the surface of the cell membrane, and when an element which is going to cause trouble for the cell gets inside, it kicks it out before it has a chance to cause trouble. And exposure um, of these bacterial cells to erythromycin can actually um, cause this gene to upregulate and therefore increase its resistance. So if you imagine that you have a single bouncer sitting at the door of a bar and suddenly, suddenly a bar fight breaks out, that bouncer is going to need help and he's going to have to call in other bouncers to help him kick out 
all the hooligans that are causing the trouble. So unfortunately, these types of genes are able to spread between species um, in something that we call lateral gene transfer. And this is actually the concern and the reason why um, perhaps you've heard in the news about resistance is because these genes are able to jump from one type of organism into another and so spread the resistant genes um, throughout populations and throughout the world. Um, now I'd like to show you how a trans transmembrane efflux pump works. And on the left side of this diagram, um, we have a, a representation of a normal bacterial cell. And the little red dots represent molecules of antibiotic. So in a normal cell, which is lacking an efflux pump, these antibiotic molecules are able to get inside the cell, reach their target, do their job, kill the cell, and that's the end of the story. But when you have one of these efflux mechanisms, um, represented by the yellow rectangle, the cells, the molecules are able to get into the cell, but then are rapidly expelled before they're able to kill the bacteria, and so the bacteria is able to survive. Now that actually uh, represents a pretty interesting strategy for combating antibiotic resistance. In this diagram, we again have a, a normally functioning efflux pump on the left, but then on the right, imagine if you could find a molecule which is better at binding to that efflux protein than the antibiotic molecule itself. That would tie up the pump and keep it busy long enough for those molecules of antibiotic to get inside and do their job and kill the cell. So where might you find such a, such a miraculous compound? And that's where drug discovery comes in. Now, traditionally, drug discovery has taken place in the terrestrial realm. I'm sure you've all heard about um, rainforests and how important it is to preserve such um, diverse environments. Well, in recent decades, researchers have started looking towards the oceans. And coral reef habitats, in particular, are very rich and diverse in, in, uh, in organisms. And in fact, next to rainforests, they're the most diverse environments on Earth. So if you go to a coral reef, what types of things might you look for? Well, most organisms that need to defend themselves against things such as predation, things trying to eat them, have defense mechanisms that we would call physical, things like claws and teeth and the ability to run away. Well, a lot of organisms on coral reefs don't possess these, these, um, these defense mechanisms. And if you look at them, a lot of them are brightly colored. They're sessile, which means that they're, um, they're stationary. They don't move around. They don't swim. They can't run away. And yet, they're very brightly colored. And you would think that something like that would be very attractive to a hungry fish or other predator. But when you get close, what you discover is that these types of organisms are able to produce chemical compounds, which ward off predators that would like to eat them or other species that would like to grow on top of them or compete with them in, in, in another way. And so this chemical warfare provides us with um, sort of a, um, a background of things to explore because a lot of these, these compounds that they produce are bioactive and have properties such as antibiotic properties, anti-inflammatory properties, anti-cancer properties that make them very interesting in drug discovery. So we go to the coral reef or to um, the bottom environment of um, a tropical um, marine ecosystem and we collect samples and we bring them back to the lab. And the first thing we do is extract the sample, which I'll spare you the details of the process, but just imagine, I'm sure many of you have vanilla extract in your, your pantries at home. And it's basically the process of ex taking the essence of something and dissolving it into um, either an alcohol or other organic solvent. And then I take these samples and use them in an assay that I've developed to test for properties which shut down the methane efflux pump. And so I have two strains that I use for this, one of which is erythromycin resistant and possesses the methane efflux pump, and one which is sensitive to erythromycin and lacks the pump. In the resistant strain, I test the bacteria plus the sample plus erythromycin and in the sensitive strain, just the sample with the bacteria alone. Now, if I see growth in the resistant strain, that means that there's been no action uh, taken on that efflux pump. But if that same sample also didn't, also had no growth in the, um, the sensitive strain, in other words, it didn't kill either the resistant or the sensitive strain, then I potentially have uh, a compound um, which 
which could um, produce a new antibiotic if it's able to kill both of these strains. But if what I'm really looking for is a compound which does not allow the resistant strain to grow, but does allow the sensitive strain to grow. So then I know that it is more than likely acting on the one, the one um, point of difference between the resistant and the sensitive strain, and that is that efflux pump. And that could lead to a potential new pump inhibitor. And this is the crux of my work. This is what I've spent the last four and a half years doing. And I'd like to reiterate that the importance of this inhibition um, is that because of the overuse of antibiotics leading to drug resistance, the sort of the armamentarium of antibiotics that we currently have today are becoming obsolete or ineffective against diseases that we thought we had under control. And the rate of discovery of new classes of antibiotics has slowed dramatically, which, if this continues, will take us back to that pre-antibiotic era that I mentioned earlier. So we need to start looking for ways to combat antibiotic resistance rather than just coming up with new forms of antibiotics because, like the ones we already have, new ones are also going to, we're going to start seeing resistance to those, or, to those antibiotics as well. So inhibiting an efflux mechanism um, presents a sort of an attractive strategy to restore drug sensitivity and resistant strains and allow the continued use of the existing antibiotics that we have now. And this is a take home message that it's not a gloom and doom prophecy that we are going to end up in this pre-antibiotic era, but we just need to reevaluate re the sort of the, uh, the goal of the pharmaceutical industry today. And with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions.